Lunch Lecture Series is a collaborative effort between Midwest Music Research Collective, MMRC, and Musicians for an Anti-Racist College, or MARC. Together, we hope this series will inspire new ways of knowing and spark dialogue. MMRC is a graduate student uh, group that focuses on providing opportunities for graduate students in and out of KU. MARC is a community action group that seeks to act against racist, exploitative, and patriarchal practice practices while facilitating spaces for decolonial thought within music studies. If anyone here is, is interested in joining MMRC or Mark or has questions, you may contact the email that will be put into the chat shortly. Um, and I'll make sure the information gets to the right person safely. Now, once again, thank you for attending and allow me a little more time to introduce our speaker. Our speaker today is James Alexander. James Alexander is a DMA candidate in cello performance at the University of Can Kansas with a cognate in orchestral conducting. His current research focuses on the cello performance in the music of P.Q. Fan, Van Anvo, and Nat Men Nguyen, and the relationship between traditional and concert music aesthetics as a part of the interdisciplinary amorphous collective. Uh, he seeks to understand and explore the various intersections of music. He will attend New Music on the Point as a performer and composer this summer, and congratulations on that as well. Uh, please remember to stay muted during the initial talk portion, or unless directed to speak. Once the talk is over, questions will be accepted by either unmuting or sending responses to the chat. Um, James's talk today is titled, Well, Cello Performance in the Music of P.Q. Vaughn, Van Anvo, and Nat Men Nguyen. Uh, please put your hands together or applause emojis and ready the oh, well, ready for clapping emojis as we welcome James. Take it away. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate you all. Thank you for being here. Uh, thank you, Brent and TJ, for having me. Um, sorry, let me uh, share my screen real quick. Um, let me know if you can't see that, but otherwise I'll assume you can. Um, so again, thank you for having me. I just wanted to practice this and say that I will be moving slightly quickly. I have another rehearsal at 1140. So this will be about half an hour presentation, hopefully 10 minute Q&A or so. So without further ado, I'll just jump right into it. Um, as Brent mentioned, uh, the title of my research is Child Performance in the Music of PQ Fan, Bon Anvo, and Yatman Nguyen. And these are all composers that were born in Vietnam, but now currently live in the United States. So if you will, I'm just going to read a bit of my abstract to hopefully not too boring for you, but just to give you a bit of an idea about where uh, my what my DMA document looks like. Um, so the various histories of musical tradition in Vietnam are indebted to the country's 54 different ethnic groups, as well as cultural influences, both near and far. Colonialism and war have also shaped the musical tradition that Vietnamese musicians living inside and outside of Vietnam have developed throughout centuries of exist existence. Musicians today, such as the composers in this study, draw from traditional and contemporary styles of Vietnamese and Usain music, that's USAIN music, and I'll explain that a little bit later, as well as other ideas learned through globalization. So the purpose of my research is to identify these different styles and help explain how they have been integrated in three respective compositions by the composers of the study. And I informed my approach by interviewing the composers on the relationship to Vietnamese and Usainian musical aesthetics. Uh, so the following will be an exploration of how their compositions combine specific aspects of Vietnamese traditional music with specific techniques used in quote, Western classical music and Again, you say in concert music. So my inquiry explores the definitions of these terms, Vietnamese traditional music, Western classical music, and you say in concert music. And it's because I believe the latter term, you say in concert music, describes the music of these three composers better than either Vietnamese traditional or Western classical music. And again, I'll explain that a little bit later. Um, so each case study has conventions of each of those terms. Vietnamese traditional Western classical to create you say in concert music, which is the sound studied, admired, performed and heard in US academies and venues. So my goal is to provide a performance manual for cello repertoire that uses aspects of traditional Vietnamese music within a you say in concert music style. 
support existing research in the fields of ethnomusicology and cello performance and similar endeavors in the future. Um, so my performance suggestions are based on correspondence with the composers and are included to help other cellists understand and perform these works. And I hope it provides a precedent to approach similar repertoire to Vietnamese traditional music, Western classical and Usain concert. So uh, to sort of address those terms right away, uh, you can see on the left, it's what could be considered Vietnamese traditional music. It's a genre called Ga Chu. And what I, I'm purposefully ambiguous here with the example on the left and the example on the right, which could be seen as, you could describe it as Usain concert music, the music performed in, as I said, the institutions and symphony halls of the United States. But again, these are, perp I, I point them out to be purposefully ambiguous and just say that they are incomplete, insufficient terms that don't really describe the complexity of either genre. So when, it, when someone says something like Vietnamese traditional music, they could be referring to a variety of genres, a variety of different instruments, and a variety of different musical modes that are used in that type of system. And uh, you saying concert music is to me a, a similar Thing. Um, in, in Western classical music, they say, you know, that it covers pretty much European music from the 16th or 17th century to 19th century. And we all generally know what we're talking about. But I, after the, in the 20th century, things started to become more ambiguous and all these terms are sort of combining. So um, you say in concert music, I sort of commandeered the term from a scholar named Dr. Michael Garber, who's a expert on the great American songbook. And um, he, he uses the great Usain songbook to, rather than the American songbook, to acknowledge the existence of native North, Central, and South American musical traditions before the adoption of the European or Western classical music tradition by the United States. So each composer in this study has been trained in the quote, Western classical style, a source from which the Usain concert music style is derived. And Usain concert music is heavily influenced by the conventions of what we know as Western classical music, but I believe the former Usain concert music is more open to the dynamic plurality of styles heard in the United States. And uh, it avoids that the this seemingly false dichotomy of Eastern and Western musics. So again, the study will focus on how these composers combine aspects of traditional Vietnamese and these other techniques we've been talking about in Western classical and Usain concert music. So first composer, PQ Pham, he's a, comp a composition professor at the University of Indiana, Indiana University, forgot which way that goes, but uh, his, his piece, Etude, written in 2004, sort of uses um, three predominant techniques which um, you'll notice the first one is familiar to you in the sort of Baroque performance practice, uh, Forch Bunung. Uh, but microtonality is something that has become more prominent in Usain concert music in the 20th century. But as you may know, it's what we know as microtonality or pitches in between the 12 notes on a piano are used quite ubiquitously in a lot of other traditional music or traditional performance practices like Vietnamese music, Indian classical music, and uh, Persian music, for example. And then a third category that he explores is sort of the combination of uh, melody and harmony that is a predominant texture in Bach. So PQ Fan was quite inspired by J.S. Bach in writing this etude, and particularly uh, J.S. Bach's unaccompanied suites for cello. So You'll notice this uh, pretty popular piece of music right here. It's the first Bach cello suite. And this texture that you're seeing is pretty characteristic of Bach style, the Forch Benung sort of the presentation, da -da -dee -da -dee -da -dee -da, that first motive that becomes uh, developed throughout the entire piece. That's a, again, a common compositional technique by J.S. Bach. And uh, so you'll see that sort of right away, or this is measure 25 of PQ Fan's Etude. Almost the same notes, but you'll notice that this is a D uh, quarter, or it's a, it's a raised natural, so sort of a half sharp uh, in between D natural and D sharp. And almost the same notes, but it would be a different sonority. And this 
is a predominant texture of PQ fans etude, which as you notice is quite similar to JS Bach and the sort of Forchbenung texture. So what you'll see is a pretty seamless integration of the Forchbenung texture, but then also this concept of microtonality or pitches in between the 12 notes on a piano. Um, this next part, which occurs earlier actually, is another example of this. Um, the, it's a seamless texture, but then the gradual increase of microtonality, even within these three measures is seen as you go from a D half sharp, regular sharp, and then a double sharp, and then a raised natural. So you can see um, he's sort of combining the sort of predominant seamless texture of Bach, again, with this concept of microtonality. Um, as I mentioned, the the sort of melodic harmonic, harmony style of Bach is seen also in P.Q. Fan's etude. The idea that um, all the notes are sort of occurring at once, but if you listen closely, you can hear a sort of melodic predominance of some notes or a hierarchy. Some notes sort of paint out a melody, whereas other notes are more harmonic. And so in, um, or more harmony, I should say. So in PQ Fan's etude, you'll see that displayed clearly. He actually, this the very top staff is, or the, the two stop, top staffs are your sounding register, whereas the bottom line is the what you play. <clears throat> and these harmonics produce the pitches up at top. So you can see how he's even increasing what J.S. Bach did, because uh, J.S. Bach did not use these sort of harmonics to increase and reach this register. So these are actually the sounding pitches. And you can see uh, a low C versus a high A. It's quite a disparate range that he's able to um, create by combining double stops, but not ordinary double stops. One notes, one are, some notes are open strings and others are harmonics. And um, so he uses these, these harmonies to create a, as I said, a, a melody out of the harmonics. And you can see that here, a sort of harmonic or a melodic gesture comprised of harmonics. And then down here, the same type of thing where there's a sort of predominance of some more melodic notes that you can see in the grace notes, whereas the harmonics themselves are more part of the harmony texture. <clears throat> so these are just some ways that uh, PQ Fan combines what I would consider the more like traditional Vietnamese aesthetics of microtonality. And um, another big thing, which I uh, should have mentioned earlier, which is that he's uh, imitating the, the Vietnamese instrument, the Dun Bo, which is a single string zither. And um, it's because it only has a single string, it relies predominantly on harmonics to create its sense of melody. And so that's why throughout PQ Fan's etude, you'll see harmonics everywhere. And it sort of imitates the technique and the timbre of the instrument. So the next composer I'd like to talk about is Van Vo. She plays, oh, this is the Dan Bao I just mentioned, the monochord zither, and uh, the Dan Chan. She also plays some other instruments, as you can see. But uh, she lives in California, and she's become a quite notable proponent of Vietnamese traditional music. Uh, she's worked with uh, acclaimed musicians like Yo-Yo Ma and Kronos Quartet. And so her piece, Awakening, is another example of how the Dun Bo has become sort of combined with what you could call, you saying concert music, inherently because it's a duet for Dun Bo and cello. And sort of the inclusion of a cello in the first place already brings you into the Western classical sort of performance practice. And so the three predominant techniques that she uses in this piece are first the, the Dunbo part itself, which has its own sort of separate technique and the techniques that are available to the Dunbo, which are tapping the bow with um, the wood, uh, like a bow, a colenio, tapping the string with a bow, sorry. Um, and what she calls the whirlpool technique, which I'll explain a little bit in a second. And then 
the other challenge is that the, the cello part itself also imitates the Dunbo. So all these things are will be explained. So the top part is the Dunbo line, and um, the bottom part is the cello line. And you can see a lot of glissandi all throughout. And this is because, again, the Dunbo has a single string, and it also has, uh, if you go back here, what you could essentially call a whammy bar or a, a, a stick that's used to tune the pitches. Once you hit the harmonic, you can then bend that stick and it will adjust the pitch. And so there's quite a vocal timbre that is that comes out of the dumbbell. And uh, so when I, I'm gonna perform this for my lecture recital on April 16th, I couldn't uh, find a Dunbow player around here. So I transcribed it for cello. And so when you play this on the cello, you sort of have to acknowledge the, the inherent difficulties of performing a melody on a single string while capturing the style that is, or the sound of the instrument itself. So a little bit later in the piece, Banan puts in what she calls the whirlpool technique, which is a, I would call it an aleatoric gesture that opens up um, opportunities for the, the cellist to imitate the natural phenomenon of the whirlpool. And so there's a lot of different sounds that sort of come out of this. Um, there's notes that can be played sort of below even the C string and also sul ponte cello, sul tasto, harmonics that occur when you, that, that sul tasto is near the fingerboard, sul ponte is near the bridge, and you're literally imitating the natural phenomenon by uh, moving your bow back and forth on the string. And she, again, sort of opens it up to whatever the performer wants to sort of feed energy back and forth between the duet partners. And um, so to talk a little bit about the the third sort of challenge of awakening is if you look at the bottom line now, you'll see these quite big leaps from an octave to a fifth. And again, this is an imitation of the Dunbow technique, which is reliant on harmonics. So jumps from an octave to a fifth are quite uh, relatively easy on the one string because of where they're located on the harmonic nodes. An octave and a fifth are are on the single string, they just sort of need to be played. And then on the, so this, she sort of integrates that into the cello part, as you can see here. Um, they're not too difficult, but it's uh, something that would be slightly easier to be played on the Dunbo. But then when transferred over to the cello, it shows how the techniques between the instruments are sort of compatible. They can sound similar to one another. All right. So, I got a sort of one last composer to talk to you about, uh, Nyatman Huyen, and he he wrote this piece actually for the lecture recital after we were talking about sort of the existence of what are conceived as traditional music genres versus art music and uh, concert music music genres, <clears throat> and I should say that uh, this was originally called cello performance in. Vietnamese art music. And I, this whole process has been quite a revealing for me in terms of what, how we use our terms and the implications that arise out of using certain terminology. So I, I realized soon after that the, by saying something like art music, you imply a non-art music. And there's really no such thing as a sort of non-art music. And art music has its own tradition. So these terms are you know, traditional art music, concert music, they're problematic. And so um, even, of course, you say in concert music is a incomplete definition. But again, I believe it's a flexible term that can be used to describe what we're talking about here, seeing as all of the composers are performing this music and it's being studied in the United States. So this last piece is perhaps the most on the head about um, addressing traditional music genres of Vietnam. Uh, Quan Ha is, per, is one of the oldest 
uh, what is considered a traditional or Vietnamese traditional music genre. And it was originally a purely vocal genre that was sang between friends in villages or and between partners, small groups of people. And it, it sort of uh, epitomizes a texture in Vietnam and other traditional practices um, of what is really complex monophony or het heterophony. And uh, this will make sense in a little bit. But uh, so there's sort of three techniques I'd like to talk about here in Nyat's piece, which are how he uses Quan Ha, the performance and aesthetics of the traditional genre, how he uses electronics and um, other modern styles that are used. So first I'd like to show this excerpt from a Vietnamese scholar of a Quan Ha melody, just to point out some of the characteristics uh, First, that there's multiple meters, that these meters are flexible and they sort of just change uh, seemingly, maybe a little bit what would seem randomly. There's a, a lot of grace notes, uh, sort of melismas, ornamentations, you could say, and this plus sign, which indicates what is called a gam or a feeling note, kind of like a blues note in between a third that is neither major or minor. And you can see there's quite a few of those and they indicate a almost like an ineffable quality to the note that the scholar uh, didn't feel that could be captured completely by the notation itself. And so as we look through these excerpts from Nyat's piece, you'll see some of the similarities uh, right away in this first piece, our first excerpt from it, you'll see those same types of ornamentations, the same types of microtonality, that could be perceived as gom notes or feeling notes. And um, what I had mentioned earlier about complex monophony or heterophony, uh, Nyat sort of tropes that idea. In the original genre, it would have been two people singing the same melody together and the differences in their personality would create nuances in rhythm and intonation. So they're singing the same thing, but not quite. Right. And it's the uh, so he plays with that idea here. Um, he the, there's an electronics playback that features some samples that I recorded. I'm playing this melody and then I also play the melody live and then I sing the melody at the same time. And Yat recorded himself singing the melody. And all these are sort of going on at once, sort of to play with that idea of a of the traditional genres, complex monophony here. Obviously, it's just between me and my former self and the composer. But again, just to take that sort of element of the performance practice and seeing how it can be applied. Nyat feels that uh, traditional and concert musics are in a survival mode of constant change and development. And so there's modern groups that have used traditional Vietnamese genres like Gachu that I had mentioned earlier and here Quan Ha in the context of pop music and electronic music to revitalize tradition and find new creative ways to be expressive. So he, this piece is in his vision, a type of laboratory where he's taking the components of different genres and styles and putting them together. So this next part is to uh, bring up the sort of rigidity that we often have in concert music. This is a, these are, excerpts from Quan Ha, but as you can see, they're played with a click. So they're meant to be sort of exacting, whereas in the original performance practice, that would have not been the case. And uh, down here, you have more of what um, are the sort of modern styles, just sort of a funky bluesy excerpt. And then as you can, as it says, a Quan Ha beatbox mashup where the cellist has to hit on different parts of the cello, sort of Again, trying to bring in Usain concert music, hip hop, and then seeing what compatible elements does that have with Quan Ha. And then nearing the end of the piece, we get into uh, a, a technique used by Helmut Lachenmann, the German composer, in uh, this idea of instrument construction. You see a bunch of different gestures here that are paired along with the electronics, and this idea of sort of creating new timbres that are 
completely outside of really what we know. And this is inspired by Prussian, by the solo cello piece Prussian by Helmut Lachenmann. If um, you don't know that piece, it's quite, uh, it was monumental, still is considered quite forward thinking for the fact that it was written five decades ago, I think. And so as you get near the end, one of the last things you hear is again, playing with this idea of complex monophony. There's several recordings of this Quan Ha melody. And I play it again live in sort of response to these previous selves um, to sort of show how, again, that even though the traditional performance practice is sort of um, far, I wouldn't say far gone, but it is it is quite far away from what is sort of relevant in uh, modern Vietnamese music today and showing how you can use the elements of that traditional performance practice here in a modern setting. And uh, so the last thing I'd like to talk about is a sort of part of the further research section, which is a composition that I wrote in response to the three case studies. And I won't spend too long here, but I, I wanted to provide a proof of concept that all of these things that I've been talking about in the case studies are definitely used in, in Usainian concert music style. So I try to break down what I believe to be sort of elemental components of various genres of trad Vietnamese traditional music. So these would be the sort of combined role of the instrument maker or the luthier, composer and performer, musical modes with necessary ornamentations and what is known here as microtonality, and an improvisatory approach to the repertoire and sound aesthetic. And so I hope to capture these types of things in this piece that you see here, where there's a, an electronics signal processing setup in the idea of like trying to create one's own instrument and also uh, improvising while you're sort of creating and responding to totally new uh, graphic scores and pitch collections. So really just trying to take back our own sort of creativity and response to tradition and trying to embody that in uh, my own composition as a response to the case studies. So in conclusion, I again, just like to reiterate that piece that you just saw and some other works I've done are responses to the case study, to the case studies and reiterate how aesthetics of the traditional Vietnamese musics are used in Usain concert music styles. Uh, the repertoire of the cello has expanded within the last century to various musical genres and disciplinary fields. Modern performance practice trends towards polystylism and requires our adaptation, in my opinion. And the case studies develop understanding of genre construction, different musical aesthetics, and pliancy through what is seemingly perennial change. So thank you all for being here. I appreciate your time and consideration a ton. Um, totally open to your questions, of course. And if you want to, I have all the works cited if you want any other information about what I've talked about. So thank you again.